All right, thank you very much for coming, everybody, and welcome to today's biodiversity seminar. It's my great pleasure to introduce to Daphna Ulfar. Uh, so Daphna did her PhD in Lausanne, then she moved for postdocs in Austria and the US. After a few years in the field of life science and wireless communication, she now serves as the executive director of the Global Mountain Biodiversity Assessment, GMBA. And this is why she's here today. She's also working there together with Mark, Mark Snedlag, who's also uh, joining today this seminar. Um, this project is from the Swiss Academy of Science from SNAT and is hosted at the University of Bern where they work there. And Daphna works at the interface between science, policy and society and supports the work of an international community of mountain biodiversity scientists and practitioners. And uh, finally, Daphna is also a mom of a 10 years old girl who shares her passion and commitment for nat nature and sustainability. Thank you very much for coming and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Naomi. Um, thank you for inviting me, inviting us, GMBA, Mark and myself, and I'm very happy to be here and to see you all. I think it's the first time I see as few laptops during a seminar as today, so it's great. Um, <laughs> let me jump right uh, into the matter of my talk. I will uh, structure it in three moments. I will first introduce you to the Global Mountain Biodiversity Assessment and then um, talk a little bit about what we currently know about, the, uh, about research um, and the state of mountain biodiversity, building on the tools and the work we are doing uh, at GMBA. And I will then move on to a third part of my talk, which is on the current efforts and options to support science-based policymaking in mountains. GMBA, the Global Mountain Biodiversity Assessment. Uh, Noemi has said it already. We are a program funded by the SNAT. Very grateful for this uh, uh, support we receive. We are a global research network of Future Earth, which is a, an international program for sustainability science. And we are co-hosted, in fact, by the University of uh, Bern with Marcus Fischer and the University of Lausanne with Antoine Guizan. The office is indeed in Bern, where I was uh, lucky enough to share, in fact, my office for a couple of years with Noemi. What uh, we are in, uh, in uh, practice, we're a platform for international and cross-disciplinary collaboration on the assessment, conservation, and sustainable management of mountain biodiversity. So really a very uh, unique and strong focus on mountain biodiversity. In practice, uh, we are a network, a network of a bit more than 1,400 uh, members across the world. Um, we work with a number of partner networks and institutions. The work is supported primarily by, as I said, our co two co-chairs, one so-called international project office with Mark and myself, and we are also supervised by a scientific steering committee uh, composed of 12 members from around the world. We have three goals. The first is to promote, harmonize, explore, and synthesize scientific research, facilitate the access to and usage of research outcomes, and the third being to provide a framework for bottom-up involvement, which is now called transdisciplinary science, but I think bottom-up does the job. And to achieve our three goals, uh, we follow five objectives. The first is to connect knowledge holders, producers, and users. And this is really the, the, the core business of a network. It's to connect people, have them know of each other, talk to each other, share information, and as I said, we're an international uh, network of people as is shown on this map. Our second objective is to provide the community at large with tools and data infrastructure. And one of the tools you might have come across used or that I'm sure you will soon use is our Global Mountain um, net, uh, uh, Inventory, which is one of those uh, open access tools we develop and make available in the office, but with the help of many of the network members. A third um, objective we have is to facilitate science, and we do that with a number of working groups, projects, and workshops, as among other things. And then as many work, uh, networks, or as is the responsibility, in fact, of the Future Earth uh, networks, we uh, are uh, trying to do our best in building capacity uh, with, a, for instance, an early career research network and a marketplace tutorial and so on. 
and to, of course, share the information, transfer the knowledge. Uh, and we do that, obviously, with a number of publications, but also as much as possible with web interfaces and then online platforms such as webinars and, and conference sessions. Having said that, uh, let me move on to what uh, we do in practice and how we explore the current state of knowledge and research on mountain biodiversity. Again, it's work we support and we do in collaboration with uh, many members of our networks and beyond. At the very heart of GMBA and the work we do is a data infrastructure. It's an infrastructure that brings together people. I told you about our members but it goes beyond our members. It brings together resources, data, information, literature, and it places all of this on a map uh, with geospatial information. In concrete terms, it's a um, relational database, and the man behind this database is sitting here. So if you have questions about it, uh, I will um, um, invite you to uh, ask Mark. And uh, such a um, data infrastructure that connects people, resources, and mountain range, as I said, geospatial information. And this geospatial information is uh, uh, linked to what I also mentioned, our global uh, inventory of the world's mountains, which looks like that, is hosted and freely available uh, online and is built uh, in a hierarchical manner that allows you to really associate information either to specific mountain ranges or scaling up to mountain systems or to, uh, to larger mountain um, regions. And here we have a little look at the, uh, the European Alps um, with uh, some details on how the, the inventory is rendered and the kind of uh, detail uh, that is available online as you uh, query this um, inventory. Now, Having all this data is, uh, is nice. It's very important to have it in place, to have it in a very um, flexible manner, available for queries, et cetera. Uh, but it's not enough. Obviously, there's a need to have uh, tools to mine this information. And over the, the course of the, the years, many uh, scientists have uh, found it interesting, and I think it's absolutely necessary to synthesize information, to put out reviews on specific topics. And the approach has been to use, of course, keywords to search the literature and then sample uh, the papers that are coming up for the relevant ones. Now, we started there as well, and I'll show you a number of results that is based on such an approach, but uh, we also realized that uh, we need to move beyond this and really capitalize on the tools that are becoming uh, increasingly available to mine the literature. And um, eventually the goal is to start with a citation database as um, the Web of Science or, or uh, Scopus and end with an annotated database that is a database of resources papers, uh, data sets, et cetera, that is tagged with a number of, of uh, search words that can then be used to, to um, analyze the data. And to do that, and here I, I um, ask you to notice that it's work in progress, so please don't share this information for now. What we do is to start with a, a search strategy that, as everyone else, is based uh, on uh, keywords and search terms but is refined over the course uh, of time um, through uh, different steps of refining the, the, the keywords also based on expert validation. So here we have also our members, our experts who ship in their knowledge and their expertise to uh, refine the words that are used to really uh, uh, scrape the, the, the large web of science to pull in as many uh, papers as possible. The outcomes is a corpus an enormous amount of, uh, of papers, of data sets, of data resources that is then, as I said, annotated. And annotation uses a number of, uh, of tools, including um, vocabularies, uh, ontologies, etc. Includes also tools to clean um, the, the outputs to eventually have a very uh, well consolidated list of publications and, and resources that can be mined. Concretely, it looks like that, or during the course of the work, obviously we don't look at all uh, um, abstracts in that uh, systematic way. It's done with a, with, a, with a code that does it automatically, but uh, in practice, the, the keywords and the ontologies and, and the vocabularies are used 
to identify contents in uh, abstracts and um, uh, flag the papers with the relevant um, keywords. And the output here again, it's data work on progress, uh, are lists of publications. And if you go, imagine going to the right of this, um, this document, you would have a number of, uh, of columns with keywords and information that allows you to, to, um, to analyze then your, your papers and your publication in quite a systematic way. Anal analysis might mean um, doing work like IPES, looking at trends and, and data and, and status of, of taxonomic groups of, of, uh, of places, or uh, doing a more systematic analysis of uh, the state of research, how much research is done where, on what topic, etc. Now applying those tools or previous versions of those tools, as I said, this is a uh, work we're in the process of developing. Um, what did we really uh, learn so far? Many of you know that, I'm sure, uh, the number of publications in mountain biodiversity science is increasing very rapidly. Um, and here we have two examples, one in Nepal and uh, in, in the Him Himalaya and one on uh, plants um, globally in the, in the Alpine uh, belt. Both examples showing that uh, indeed the number of publications is increasing. Yet when applying, in fact, the more advanced tool I was just uh, mentioning, what becomes clear um, is that those publications are quite biased. They are biased in terms of uh, the spatial coverage and in terms of the taxonomy or taxonomically taxonomic groups that are being covered. Here, what we are looking at is a world map uh, with results from a large effort uh, in our working group on uh, mountain soil biodiversity led by colleagues in, uh, in um, Austria, where um, beyond doing a kind of a traditional review of the literature, we have indeed been looking at where research is being performed and on what, um, on what taxonomic group. And what you can see here is that there's clearly way more science being done and published, uh, for instance, in Asia, and in the Himalaya region than uh, in uh, Southern Africa, for instance. Now, doing it at the, at the scale of all, uh, at the level of all taxonomic group was uh, the first step. And then for each uh, taxonomic group independently, we've been running the same kind of analysis, again, using uh, the tools put together by Mark. And this is also a figure uh, Mark put together uh, to look into more details on where uh, groups such as uh, um, uh, uh, fungi, protists, etc., microorganisms are being studied uh, in the world. And here again, we can see uh, biases in uh, the region of the world where science is being performed and on what uh, taxonomic group in particular. And why does that matter? Well, obviously, because it, we do need to understand where uh, science is missing, where science needs to be um, performed, where data is uh, needed. To, um, to bridge gaps and to improve our understanding of, of biodiversity in general and uh, the evolution of, of uh, biodiversity and ecosystems. Now, one can do the same with uh, data sets. And here it's just a, a quick uh, glance at uh, where data exists uh, in the Gloria, Marion, and Dimes databases on mountain biodiversity and how long those um, data have been collected and in what uh, uh, elevational belt in mountains. So whether there is more data at the, at the top of mountains or at the bottom and without going into too many details here again, we can see that some mountain uh, regions are quite well covered and others are not that well covered at all. And that um, the coverage, the spatial and the temporal coverage um, of data sets varies quite a bit. And we're talking here about long-term monitoring of, of biodiversity. The same holds true for Switzerland uh, with uh, work we are doing uh, together with colleagues at the University of Lausanne that also shows that uh, although biodiversity is sampled uh, um, quite largely in Switzerland with the green parts of the of the pies, the um, sampling happens either at the top of the mountain with the Gloria projects or uh, pretty much at the bottom in the forest and VSL is obviously a major player in a long term monitoring of mountain forests in Switzerland. So again, uh, a bias here that can be detected using uh, approaches such as the one we are trying to promote and make available. And finally, not to speak only about biodiversity here, look at um, uh, biodiversity relevant climate 
monitoring data and here as well using uh, large uh, uh, data sets uh, that we are we are mining with with different tools uh, we can indeed uh, see how well or poorly um, our mountains are being monitored in terms of uh, um, climate uh, precipitation and temperature with um, in Argentina and Kenya and Switzerland just uh, for comparison now here we go um, moving on from a simple observation on where we are at with data coverage, with knowledge coverage, um, I'm now going to show some examples that we have extracted from those data. And here I'm combining uh, information from uh, online surveys, um, literature analysis, and uh, individual projects. And that covers, in, in, in fact, the kind of work we are supporting with our working groups, with our projects, and uh, um, with our um, office time. What do we know about mountain biodiversity uh, in the face of global change? Well, what we can see here is that uh, mountain ecosystems generally are um, in a deteriorating state. We see here the, the bioclimatic belt, so the more or less uh, the, uh, the division of mountains in, in, in uh, sections of above the tree line, forest and grasslands and also freshwater, and we have here data for uh, Eastern Afromontane, the Hindu Kush Himalaya, the Andes, and the European Alps. And what you can see, uh, if I find the pointer, which is here, is that um, we have a lot of those uh, red big uh, squares, which indicate that uh, this, the status of ecosystem is poor, is in the ecosystems are in a, in a degraded state, and the trend is towards uh, worsening of the situation. This is the case, as you can see, in many mountain ranges uh, or mountain regions of the world, with an exception of the European Alps, which uh, are in a better state, uh, state than other mountain ranges. And um, generally, um, above the tree line, the situation is not as uh, bad as below. Another way to look at it uh, here in uh, Tanzania, uh, where through a participatory workshop, we try to assess the state of mountain ecosystems and biodiversity as well. And those data pretty much confirm what we're seeing before with both the area and the condition of uh, uh, ecosystems in the Kilimanjaro region that um, are degrading on the left hand side. So. Um, surveys, literature, and uh, workshops confirming something we observe, something we know, but something that needs to be described and, and said loudly, uh, and that is that mountain ecosystems are deteriorating. And um, a last uh, indication in a recent paper was the decrease of uh, mountain forest um, coverage over time in different regions of the world. Um, this for the state of mountain ecosystems. Now species, assessing the, the state of species through um, a survey turned out to be quite difficult. So I'm referring here to uh, assessment work that was done by others uh, and specifically by a unit published in, later on in the IPES report for Africa and uh, showing that mountain biodiversity is um, often concentrated in places that are uh, mountainous. As you can see on the right-hand side here, we have uh, for Africa, the different larger mountain systems. And those larger mountain systems are hosting biodiversity hotspots. And each of the different colors, red, green, and orange show the state of biodiversity in those hotspots. And what you can see is that many of uh, hot, uh, biodiversity hotspots that are in mountains are critically endangered. And that confirms other results, uh, for instance, uh, here for amphibian, published just recently by Lütke, that also shows that the greatest, greatest concentration of threatened amphibian species are indeed in mountain regions that I've put here uh, squares around. Um, so generally speaking, uh, mountains are rich in biodiversity, but much of this biodiversity is uh, endangered. Um, and although we don't have yet um, dramatic losses of species, um, we can expect that uh, this is likely to happen. 
other ways to look at uh, mountain, uh, the state of mountain biodiversity, here again, tapping into uh, publication and existing assessment, here the latest uh, IPES assessment on invasive species. We also can uh, um, observe and, and, um, and um, validate that um, uh, species are on the move. And that's one of the reasons why we don't yet see dramatic uh, declines in species is that they're still moving. There's still room on top of the mountains or along the slope to move up. That also uh, holds for invasive species with work uh, from colleague at the ETHC showing that uh, the upper elevation limit of many uh, taxonomic groups is uh, increasing with species, um, invasive species uh, observed uh, higher and higher. This is also described in the EPES uh, assessment, which um, unlike previous assessment was quite rich in mountain information, which is a good thing. And finally, data that we all know, but still worth showing uh, indication of species on the move uh, up the mountains uh, here published quite some years ago already based on Gloria Roy, but uh, also showing that uh, with uh, increasing temperatures, species uh, tend to um, go up the hills, the slopes. Mountains, mountain biodiversity cannot be um, uh, looked at without uh, making the link to ecosystem services. And so here I'm showing uh, data that is again uh, based on, on work we are doing uh, on, on mining literature and knowledge. Here, uh, ecosystem service access. Again, in the four regions I was mentioning before, Eastern Afro Mountain, Hindu Kush Himalaya, the Andes, and the European Alps. And what we can see here uh, is that, again, we have a lot of those red uh, uh, rectangles, uh, which indicate that uh, access to ecosystem services is deteriorating, and in particular for the uh, habitat uh, creation and maintenance, water quantity, and food and feed. Those are the ecosystem services that are systematically mentioned as being um, uh, more increasingly more difficult to access by experts. Confirmed by data in the field uh, here in Nepal, a work of a PhD in, uh, in, uh, that was co-hosted by the University of Bern, which shows as well that we have a negative trend in the access to a number of ecosystem services in Nepal. And again, we have uh, food and feed habitats and uh, freshwater um, being the more, uh, or the, the more frequently mentioned as being more and more difficult to access. Literature offers us uh, additional information here, a very uh, freshly published uh, uh, paper showing where, um, where the regions that are the most important for NCPs, so uh, ecosystem services of nature's contributions to people and species are. And uh, in dark blue, we have uh, the areas that are the most, um, or the, the top uh, in the top 5%. And again, we are in uh, many cases in uh, mountain ranges, in mountain regions. So all to that to say that we are looking at the access here, we are looking at the provision of uh, ecosystem services, and we are observing the same trends with uh, a tendency towards a deterioration of access and provision across around the world. And the value of uh, the global mountain biodiversity assessment is also that we are working at a global scale. So we, we, we work towards comparing situations across the world and, and collecting and, and synthesizing data, not on a specific regions, but specific region, but really uh, largely um, across the world. Now, um, of course, biodiversity is changing. The mountain ecosystems are deteriorating. Now the question is why? And here I'm showing you data again for the same uh, world regions, um, indicating what uh, experts see as the major drivers of change in mountain biodiversity and ecosystems, and what explain and and what is the trend in those uh, in those drivers. And here we are talking only about direct drivers, uh, land use change, climate change, etc. And what we can see here, based on our uh, our expert, is that. Um, Above the tree line uh, in, in at least East Afro Mountain and the Hindu Kush, climate change is, uh, is uh, um, mentioned to be the main driver, 
while um, land use change uh, is uh, named in the Andes and the European Alps. And as we go down uh, the elevation and gradient, land use change is really uh, appearing as the most cited uh, driver of change in biodiversity and ecosystems in mountains. Uh, obviously, that varies between regions uh, to, to some extent, but I think it is worth using such analysis to, to uh, place uh, the, the current discourse on climate change in mountains a little bit in perspective and also realizing that um, whereas climate change is indeed happening, happening very fast, other drivers such as uh, land use change are um, important and they are in fact also increasing as we can see here with those, uh, again, those red uh, rectangles showing that uh, um, both the, the, the strength of the driver and the impact are in many cases increasing and, and getting worse. As a comparison, uh, as I said, those results are based partially on, on surveys. We can do thanks to our, our network members and on literature work and here, uh, I'm just briefly showing you the same kind of, of results, but based only on, uh, on literature and uh, looking at uh, the, the papers available, um, we can again confirm the trends we're seeing earlier with a very important um, um, role of uh, land use change in green in driving uh, patterns in mountain biodiversity and ecosystems and uh, a tendency to uh, a stronger, stronger uh, effect of climate change above the tree line. Mountain biodiversity, as I said, and as I showed, is um, evolving in the face of climate change. It is uh, deteriorating, it is uh, at risk. And um, the data I was showing are not the most recent one. We did this work, we started it in, I think, 2018. So it's not fresh out of the press. It's not even in press, unfortunately, but maybe it will at some point. Um, but the fact is that such assessment and such uh, uh, summaries of trends and, uh, and, and patterns in mountain biodiversity are not uh, readily available. So um, there is a good reason to do that. And I'll, get back, I'll come back to our next efforts uh, at the end of our talk. But um, because um, biodiversity is in a, in a, in a fragile the state, uh, it is important to make not only um, sci other scientists aware of it, but also policies, policymakers, administrations, etc. And for the third part of my talk, I'm now moving on to uh, current efforts and options to support science-based policymaking in uh, mountain regions. And um, to place things in a bit of a context, mountain biodiversity and international policy way back in the days, there was something about biodiversity in mountains in uh, international policies with uh, the IG biodiversity target, target 14, and specific indicators that had been proposed and used to, mo to monitor the state of mountain biodiversity. We had the um, coverage by protected areas of important sites for mountain biodiversity and the famous mountain green cover index. The IG target, our history, they ended in 2020. In the meantime, 2015, we had the Agenda for Sustainability. And here as well, in fact, mountains were there after a very strong effort of the Mountain Research Initiative in Bern to have mountains represented with, in fact, two SDGs, six and 15. SDG 15 is usually the one that is most cited when we, we are amongst mountain uh, people. And there again, we have, we have, we had, we have, because it's still ongoing, indicators uh, to monitor the state of mountain biodiversity um, over time. And again, the same uh, indicators as for uh, the IG target. Now, uh, the SDG agenda or the sustainability at the sustainability agenda is ongoing. So we are still uh, using those indicators to monitor the state of mountain biodiversity. But uh, in the newly uh, agreed Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, mountains are gone, unfortunately. At least the word mountain doesn't appear anymore uh, in the main uh, text, despite some efforts um, of uh, UNEP environment, for instance, and the uh, uh, global research networks such as ours and uh, the Mountain Research Initiative to um, promote mountains in this agenda as well. Now, there's nothing absolutely specific to mountains, but there's still this target three, 
that uh, uh, opens the door for mountain biodiversity uh, scientists and policymakers uh, with uh, this statement that uh, particular uh, areas of particular importance for biodiversity and ecosystem functions and services need to be um, to be uh, protected. And obviously, uh, mountains are areas of importance for biodiversity and ecosystems. So the, op the door is open for us as mountain biodiversity community to uh, promote uh, biodiversity protection also uh, in our mountains. And um, ongoing work now, ongoing efforts at GMBA in collaboration with many different institutions revolve around uh, trying to support mountain countries in enacting the global biodiversity framework, even though there's nothing specific about mountains in it. And one tool to do so is the famous uh, program of work on mountain biodiversity. As you can see in yellow, the first version, the last version was approved in 2004. And so um, the approval of the global biodiversity framework is also a great occasion to pick up on this program of work and refresh it. And uh, the ongoing process is on improving or revising uh, this program of work to really have a number of, uh, of, um, of um, recommendations for countries to follow in order to um, uh, protect as much as possible the biodiversity they have in, in their mountains. It's work on progress. The end of it is at COP 16 uh, in the fall. And in between there are different um, events to try uh, to bring together like-minded working uh, countries, like on the right-hand side, an event that we organized at uh, SAPSTA 25 in October, um, and uh, work hand-in-hand -hand with countries to encourage them to not give up on their mountains, but really to, uh, to pick up on existing indicators and adopt new indicators to monitor the state of biodiversity um, in their mountains and report on them. Now, reporting on mountain biodiversity, as I said, is possible with certain indicators. One indicator is indicator 15.4.1 on the coverage of important size, uh, sites for mountain biodiversity. I've mentioned it before. And part of our work uh, is also to support uh, the countries in using reliable indicators and useful indicators. And uh, here I will end my talk by showing you the, um, some work we've done just recently to provide countries with um, useful information to report on the mountains. Now this indicator, as I said, has been approved uh, in the framework of the Aichi target and is an indicator as many, if not most other indicators, which is uh, provided at national level. And when you think of mountains and national level, you start wondering how a national level indicator can in fact inform about how to protect mountains because mountains within a country are so numerous and different. So. With this observation, we embarked on what turned out to be quite an adventure, but we embarked on the project of trying to uh, disaggregate national indicators to the level of individual mountain ranges and provide policymakers and administration with um, ways to better plan the conservation of the or the protection of the mountain biodiversity with uh, mountain range specific information. To do that, we took the official data and workflow, which you can see on the left-hand side here, and we combined it again with our mountain inventory as a second example of how to use this inventory. And again, I encourage you to have a look at it and apply it also yourself, if it's of interest to you. Combining those two um, layers of information, uh, led to the production, as I said, of disaggregated values so SDG indicator values, not only at national level, but also at the level of individual mountain ranges. And this information has been made available um, online for uh, scientists as well as uh, policymakers and other uh, stakeholders to, um, to look at. And here, what you can see for Switzerland um, is that uh, while uh, we have a value of, I think, is it 23 point something at national level? Here, uh, the, the, those um, coverage of uh, biodiversity, impo important biodiversity areas by protected areas vary by mountain range, with some mountain ranges being well covered, 
uh, important sites for mountain biodiversity being well covered in certain mountain um, ranges and very poorly covered in others. Additional information uh, made available uh, allows uh, uh, scientists as well as other users to compare in a visual manner uh, this coverage uh, on uh, infographics like that with um, the coverage by protected uh, areas uh, of key biodiversity areas, those areas important for biodiversity in mountains are uh, ranking from uh, uh, light yellow to dark yellow and uh, KBA cover um, from uh, light yellow to blue. And obviously the, 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 the best situation is when you have many uh, key biodiversity areas identified in your mountain ranges and most, of, if not and of every of them are well covered. This is obviously uh, the case when you are in the green and it's mostly not the case in Switzerland, for instance, and um, not bashing on Switzerland, but uh, as we are in Switzerland, it was uh, realizing that even a country like Switzerland has some more work to do on covering and protecting its mountain biodiversity. And that is shown here as well. So the work we did in disaggregating um, uh, this in SDG indicator to the level of mountain ranges also allowed us to place those, this information in an international context. And uh, in that uh, context, I was very happy to see uh, the latest paper of some of you here that uh, also uh, emphasize the importance of transboundary collaboration on uh, protecting mountain um, areas and their biodiversity. And what you can see here is um, on the left-hand side, uh, a map of Switzerland and its surrounding countries with um, uh, key biodiversity areas that are either not protected at all in red, very well protected in dark green and uh, somewhat protected in light green. And what you can see is that uh, certain areas that are rich in biodiversity are, for instance, poorly covered by protected areas by Switzerland, but are well covered by, for instance, France or Italy. Um, so something to reflect on, and I think it's partly also a, a point you made here in your latest paper um, on, on alpine um, areas. What happened when we did this work, and it's, it was eventually another very important message we wanted to, to get across to uh, uh, our audience, is that um, we had to kind of make up our own workflow. Uh, we did start with the official workflow, but then realized that we had to tweak it a bit uh, to be able to disaggregate our, our, um, our indicator to the level of individual mountain range. And by doing so, uh, it occurred to us that we ended up with somewhat different results at the national level than the official workflow. And there's no right and there's no wrong. Uh, what we want to emphasize though, and which is also um, a point we made in uh, the paper that we published on it by um, Amin Ali, who was a PhD student at Stanford who worked for us with us for a while. And I forgot to put her name there, but uh, the work is, is hers. Um, the message we want to put forward is that the, the way those indicators that we use to report on mountain biodiversity are calculated need to be understood and the assumptions behind those indicators and the methods need to be made clear, transparent, and we need to be aware of them when we develop a discourse on um, how well or how uh, better we can protect uh, mountain biodiversity. And here we are again in Switzerland. Um, with in blue uh, a calculation that uh, we have developed as an alternative to the official calculation and in red the values of this indicator at the national level over time using uh, the so-called site-based approach taken um, by uh, official institution. And here's one example where uh, our, um, the values we calculate are much lower than the official values on the left-hand side, you have this little plot that shows the comparison of all the countries um, uh, or the, com the comparison between the two methods for all the countries. And as you can see, while Switzerland is, is below the line, that is the area-based calculation method leads to lower values than the uh, other methods, other countries are above the line. And that will depend on a, a large number of, um, of parameters and reasons. 
But all to say again is that th there's, there's no reason to, to judge or misjudge any of those methods, but it's uh, useful to combine them, to put things into perspective, and to question uh, uh, the, the, the results of those methods in the light of the assumption they make. We obviously, as I said, publish this work because that's what we are supposed to do as scientists, but uh, the main uh, objective was also to make all this information available in a useful way to various audiences. And as I said, some of it is online uh, with um, an inter interactive uh, web interface to, uh, to um, travel around the world and see how well or, or poorly mountain uh, biodiversity is protected, but we also have produced those one pages, and that's always only one of two page, two sides um, of the coin, so to speak, um, uh, providing uh, the information I've presented uh, now to uh, different audiences in um, a very compact um, format. What's next? Um, Getting back to the first part of my, or the second chapter of my presentation, we are crunching uh, papers, uh, resources, and um, the, our, our objective is to fill a, a large gap, which is that there is no global assessment of mountain biodiversity. There are assessments, IPES has done a fantastic work, but there's none about mountains specifically here as well for good reasons, but we believe that there's um, room and the necessity to fill this gap. And this is something we are launching now um, with the hope that it takes off and that we manage to do that. And the goal is to really do a so-called systematic mapping of the literature that is really gain an overview of where mountain biodiversity research is being performed and identify research trends and gaps uh, in line with the, the nice uh, figures that uh, Mark did for uh, soil biodiversity and to perform a more traditional systematic literature review, which is uh, synthesizing existing evidence in the lines of the results I've been showing you, but really based on a very, very large uh, corpus uh, of annotated um, resources. And uh, the next step from a science policy perspective is the COP16, towards which we are working in collaboration with the Convention for Biological Diversity and UNEP Environment. And again, in trying to um, uh, promote mountains and the use of specific indicators for the monitoring of mountain biodiversity um, within the framework of the global mountain, uh, the global biodiversity framework. And with that, I'm on time, and I'm ending uh, my talk with this uh, painting of Villeneuve, uh, uh, who is a, a, a artist from where I'm I'm coming from, the Canton de Vaud who kindly offered this, uh, this um, painting to GMBA to use uh, in presentation and talks. So thanks to this artist and thank you for listening. Thanks to the virtual audience uh, for uh, being part of this moment and um, thank you for questions. Thank you very much. It was very interesting overview of your work. Uh, do we have questions from the audience or from online as well? Please. Yes. Maybe I'm wrong, but I got the impression in some of the analysis presented, the definition of a mountain range or mountain ecosystem was not unique or, or, or the same. What is the definition of a mountain ecosystem in your database? The definition of a mountain ecosystem or a mountain. <laughs> so you are opening a can of worms, in fact, because uh, there is an ongoing debate about how to define a mountain. And um, there are several definitions that have been proposed over the years, uh, starting with uh, uh, in fact WCMC in 20 yeah in 2000 to put out a definition of mountains used for uh, mapping uh, mountain forests and this definition is um, is including more or less uh, rolling hills and and uh, and uh, relative or relatively flat terrain 
came then Christian Körner, who some of you might know, and who decided so that uh, a definition of mountains need to be specific uh, when you talk about mountain biodiversity. And he used parameters such as ruggedness uh, to define mountains and ended up with way less mountains in the world than um, UNEP because his uh, definition was stricter. Uh, and, uh, um, and so we have, uh, we have more or less mountains extent in the world, depending on those definition. And recently, a couple of years ago, USGS came up with a third definition that includes even more, uh, I won't say flatland, but rolling hills than uh, uh, the definition by UNEP. And none is right and none is wrong. Like uh, for the indicators, um, it's a matter of, of uh, being clear about what assumptions are made when uh, um, uh, choosing a uh, mountain definition and being clear about the consequences. And in the work I've presented today, the mountain definition is, I think for nearly all the results, it's the mountain definition by Christian Körner, but for the mountain inventory and the work we did on, uh, on the um, SDG indicators, we used an, um, a revised version of this uh, definition, which uh, we developed uh, together with the inventory. And that differs a bit from the initial corner definition, but not all that much. But of course, depending on what definition you will use, uh, the outcomes of your analysis will change. And uh, uh, this is definitely something that needs to be made clear in all communications and it's could you raise the point. And then in terms of, of mountain ecosystems per se, again, uh, how you define uh, the tree line and say it's above the tree line or below the tree line is also um, a, a matter of, of um, debate to some extent. Uh, Dirk, you have put out a very, or you're working on a very nice way of representing uh, the different the bioclimatic layers in, uh, in mountains and attribute um, processes and species, et cetera to different uh, forms of uh, mountain ecosystems. And this is work in progress, work that will never end probably, uh, also because a number of factors that are being used to, uh, or, or variables that are being used to define those ecosystems and regions are changing over time now. Um, so nothing here is, is, is written in stone. Uh, but I think, again, uh, defining things from the onset, and I haven't made it as clear as I could have here indeed, uh, is uh, necessary to avoid um, conflicting results that are mainly due to uh, the way we define things. Um, <clears throat> over here still, if that's okay. Thank you, Davno, for a great talk. So I was wondering about the amphibian work that you mentioned and the, I'm kind of linking it in my head to the invasive species work. So amphibians, a lot of the drivers of the global extinctions are, of course, chytrid fungus and BD, and mountains can offer some protection from that for being like refugia against invasive species. In that analysis, did you check if um, the enrichment of mountain areas for threatened fungi was due to the extinction of fungi and non-mountain, of, 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 of frogs and non-mountainous areas? If you refer to the to the one map, uh, yeah. uh, that is work we did not do ourselves. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I would uh, feel more comfortable. Uh, no, no, I'll read the paper. Send you to the paper. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. Uh, thanks for the talk and uh, this amazing work. Uh, I was thinking of glacier retreats uh, because we can see it on both sides, and one side would be that it's an opportunity for species to conquer a new habitat. Do you take this into the scientific literature or not? And also in the biodiversity um, assessment. If I do what? Sorry, I did not. Take into account the glacier retreats in the future. Yeah, I think um, do, do that what I would call those emergent ecosystems. And um, among the people working within GMBA or the GMBA network, we definitely have scientists looking at that. Um, and uh, uh, in that sense, and because it's, uh, there's increasing literature about that, we will touch on it in the, in the assessment and definitely or those, those publications will be part of the larger corpus uh, on which we, we are working and will be working. Um, and I think it's a, it's a growing topic of, of, uh, of interest. And, and so um, it would be a misplaced to, to leave it out. But as in our 
current work, we're not specifically looking at it, but definitely um, seeing it as another um, um, chapter or sub-chapter in, in the work we're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Or do we have any questions from online? Sorry. That's it. So I was, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> I was a bit fascinated looking at your slide where you had, I guess, people's impressions or else literature results of what the important driver was across different mountain regions. And in the Himalayas, it was all climate change and everywhere else it was all crops. And I was wondering if, because you have information say on climate change and probably some information also on crops and crop or land use change and do these differences in perception actually map match what you might see on sort of a map of climate change or land use change does it actually make sense from are there perceptions actually capturing this sort of global reality or is it just different cultures that have worry about different things i think given that um, i'm just going back to uh, this uh, slide, because I think you were talking about that one, right? I was talking about that one, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. And uh, the crop is just to, to illustrate um, uh, land use change, not necessarily uh, the fact of growing crop. But um, what seems to be the case is that uh, if you look at uh, publications, which is what we're looking at here, uh, and looking at how many papers mention, uh, for instance, land use change, um, in uh, as a as a driver as a main driver of uh, change um, above the the tree line or, or below wherever uh, you can see that um, uh, we are uh, confirming the the perceptions of um, climate change being the most important driver uh, at least in some uh, regions of the world so we have the blue bar uh, being uh, the highest above the tree line everywhere here and whoop, um, in the Issa Fromontaine and the Hindu Kush only uh, based on perception. So uh, the, 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 the results are quite, um, uh, are quite um, consistent between those, uh, those uh, surveys we made and um, the analysis of the literature. But, and, and I think it's, uh, yeah, from also the further work we've done and, and the um, other um, analysis, the this this uh, tendency to to uh, acknowledge or to measure climate change as being particularly important above the tree line and uh, and in alpine and higher areas and um, land use change to be really a, a main driver elsewhere is uh, seems to be seems to be quite confirmed. The fact is that uh, in the the literature also in the Hindu Kush Himalaya and the news and so on is putting a lot of emphasis on climate change, being particularly rapid in those areas, et cetera. So we can't exclude that there's a bias in, in, in the ways uh, people perceive and in the, in the culture of assessing what makes the, uh, nature change. Um, but I would, in that sense, be uh, promote again, the, the use of all this different form of information uh, and, and pack it together to shed uh, different lights onto a, a same reality and make sure that the, the, the outcomes we, we, or the conclusions we formulate are encompass uh, all, those, uh, all those types of information. I mean, I guess just following up on that, what I'm trying to say is you have maybe an additional piece of information and that is actually like what is happening, like what's measured in terms of climate change mm -hmm. and land use change across mm -hmm. these places. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is climate change so much greater in the Himalayas because there, it seems to be something everybody worries about mm -hmm. than it is in the Eastern. I mean, I'm just curious in the Afro Montane. I mean, I just, yeah. I remember like once seeing a map of like the US and where we have the most climate change and where we have, and the least climate change and where we have the climate deniers. And they're in the places where you have least climate change. So it somehow, right, there's lots of other problems with that, but that somehow it's like really interesting to see that the patterns of what's actually your reality in the world, are they actually reflected in these papers or not? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, an important point you make is indeed there are layers of information that need to be, or that can be um, intersected with all this information. And uh, um, it's certainly one additional uh, 
dimension we are considering when, when talking about um, this assessment we hope we'll get off the ground is to really tap into this resource as well. Um, yeah, thanks. Do you have any questions online? No? Any more questions from the audience? In, maybe I have a question. Um, uh, maybe first, uh, when you're looking at the drivers of change here in biodiversity and ecosystems, uh, you said at some point that you looked at the status of ecosystems, they were degraded or not, and I was just wondering how you assess uh, how is the ecosystem? In what that case, it was, uh, uh, we did that using uh, the online survey, and we were um, asking experts to assess or to, to share their, their uh, knowledge and their, uh, their perception of how the area um, has changed. And here as well, huh? there's mapping options that allow to refine those preliminary results uh, quite a bit, and um, the condition. Uh, uh, of, of the ecosystem, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, generally uh, maintained or whether there is some evidence for habitat, uh, um, um, what's the word, I missed the word. <laughs> Degradation as well, but um, uh, connectivity issues and, and so on, um, yeah. And um, also I was wondering, um, at the beginning when you, um, we're showing all the publications that you're digging through. Um, oh, I guess most of the literature is in English, um, but especially in those in, in regions that are not uh, native English speaking, where we don't have so much information. Uh, how do you uh, look at the literature there? Is there also, do you also look at other languages or uh, how do you assess the... It's wishful thinking that we would do it. Indeed, it's totally biased towards uh, 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 literature in English, and it's a general issue. It's, it also, for the time being, includes only uh, uh, peer-reviewed um, uh, literature and not yet uh, gray literature, etc. cetera. It, it's definitely uh, something to think more about and, and try to, to address uh, to be able to, to um, uh, include literature from uh, places in the world where English is not necessarily used for, for publishing. And in that sense, we are uh, working towards establishing uh, uh, regional hubs mm -hmm. for GMBA with the, the hope that we can uh, gradually uh, increase our engagement with local uh, scientists and local um, researcher communities who would um, open up the, or pave the pave the way for us to access information that's uh, not otherwise accessible because of language issues. Um, yeah, I think there's a, there's another life to spend on that. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any final questions? If not, I think it's time to leave for lunch. Uh, thank you very much again, Daphna, for your talk. And please join us uh, for lunch now at the Mensa.